actually Christopher Nolan uh, is the worst science fiction maker ever. This will be our precap. Then everyone will watch this video. Any guy who's a fan of science, especially if you're a lay person like me, yeah. would immediately know that Christopher Nolan is not a fan of science. He might be a fan of science fiction and films. I think he's more a fan of films. Hi everyone, welcome to Chalchitra Talks. My name is Vani hai and this is another of our guest episodes. In this episode, we have with us Manu Joseph, who is a writer and journalist. You may know him from his best-selling books, Serious Men, The Illicit Happiness of Other People. And a few days ago, Weber and I had the opportunity to sit down with him and talk to him about his favorite books, movies, music, and so on. And we discussed a lot of things in the process. So without wasting your time, let's just jump right in. Hi Manu, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you for having me over. It's uh, absolutely our pleasure. And uh, like I told in the book club as well that we were getting you over and everyone was very excited. And I'll just start with something that I personally am interested to know. Like what are you reading at the moment? I'm actually reading a, a book on, uh, on it's the basics of software and hardware and computers. It basically okay. actually starts with electricity. It is that basic, you know, and it's beginning to explain. I just started for the birthday gift. Uh, so I'm just beginning to start it. So, uh, so that is, that is what I'm reading right now. The Hidden Language of Computer Code. That is the book I'm reading. I wanted also to know from you, like, uh, are there any no-nos that you have in writings? Uh, for example, I see metaphors in writings and eight out of ten times I just roll my eyes and move on from that text. Does it ever happen to you when you see something and you're like, hey, it's not my cup of tea and you just move on to the other book? And, yeah, see, which is yeah. my problem with novels and why I enjoy novels far less than uh, my, my readers is yeah. that I have too many problems with novels. You know, I basically, I also have, I feel that most novels are actually mediocre or bad. Uh, so I have this long standing problem with exclamation mark. I just feel that it is one thing in this world, which is unnecessary. Okay. Because if you need an exclamation mark to exclaim, why are you a writer? You, you're, you're supposed to say stuff. Of course, people will give me the example of Joyce and uh, releases and a lot of other books uh, to show you know how how you can do some things playfully okay. I grant all that a few years ago I was the editor of a magazine I banned the two things one is the exclamation mark and two is Bengalis writing about other Bengalis I felt that the quality of the magazine improved but then because when you ban an exclamation I, I realized people have to choose think of words and think of sentences and first of all Consider, is this word exclamation in the first place? Hello? Exclamation, like what? He just said hello. You know, do you want to say that the person is exuberant and excited to meet you? Then, then you feel that hello is inadequate. Then why are you even writing hello? You know, think of a situation, you know, where that exclamation can come. I just find it more challenging when you remove the exclamation mark. You challenge yourself, and the exclamation mark is just one of the things. There are many things like that. And when we take them off, we work a bit harder to, to achieve the marvelous results uh, that we need. Yeah. And also the metaphor that you said is very interesting because many writers uh, think they are generalists in the sense that they, they, can, they can do everything. But, but it actually, writing is very niche. It has its own silos. And a lot of people are very bad at metaphor. Mm -hmm. And I feel that they should not even be trying. A lot of poets have very interesting way of, ways of writing. In fact, a lot of poets are obviously underrated novelists. I, will, I recently started a book called Beautiful Losers by the singer uh, Leonard Cohen. Yeah. And I thought, and actually, I didn't know he was, he was a good novelist. I, mean, I was just ignorant. I, did, I just knew him as a songwriter and a singer. But, he, you know, this guy, I mean, obviously can write when you put up guess from his songs, he's funny and he's shocking uh, and not very nice. So actually the point that you raised is more important uh, than just, uh, it, is, it is important and not just amusing because uh, it was one of the old enemies I had right from the start, you know, that the, the, a, a wrong word, a wrong label 
creates a very uh, creates a, a wrong idea, and I feel that bad prose is more influential than good prose because it's like junk food. You know, it's easy to understand. You latch on to it, and uh, and it's there forever. You know. I think I think you use that for the Ashwin post also, where Ashwin at posted. Yeah, the the, so the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, it's one of those things which just amuses me. You know, how many times, uh, uh, especially when people are going through. Because if you're, if you're in a cave and you see the light at the end of something, you know, yeah. then it is challenging and interesting. So when you say there's light at the end of the tunnel, you already know you're in a tunnel. This is a very so good tunnel. Tunnel leads to the exit. You know, there are two exits. You know, that is how you know it's a tunnel. So if you say that I don't know whether it's a tunnel or a cave, and then I saw light, right? So that is interesting. Okay. Very nice. And that then, but then you, I mean, imagine me trying to tell Ashwin, he's like, what the, what the hell is wrong with this guy? He's like, <laughs> man, I just said something deep and something I felt from my heart, and this guy is ruining it, right? I so finally, I, I'm finally getting to play, <laughs> and like this guy is after what? <laughs> what are your top three books that you'd like to recommend to people who, like, if someone wants to go for an uh, a balanced opinion today in terms of history, in terms of politics, what do you think are the most books or uh, reads that he can refer to while looking for a balanced opinion? It is so difficult to write a book that a person's motivation. Is uh, is inseparable from the uh, the end product, the book itself, and uh, I feel that nobody sets out to write to be balanced. In fact, I feel that uh, the only good thing that has happened uh, in recent times, of course, journalism, credibility, academics, everything has been ruined by politics, and because people have become extremely political, and that is also because people people are amateurish in the political belief. We'll cover that later. Because, uh, so uh, I feel that, I mean, I, I, I have stopped reading history and politics to understand, even climate change. Uh, recently, I asked uh, a person whose views I respect for uh, a good scientific book on climate change. I don't want the politics, but I just want to fully understand the science, but believe in it. Because now for history and philosophy, I am leaning on science. When I feel that I want to read uh, something philosophical. I, I lean on science and the best histories I've read, I've read in recent times are science histories, you know? So, uh, uh, so that is where I, I get a lot of satisfaction. The political history, I've, I, I don't know how much of it, I mean, some, of the, some of the books I used to, uh, you know, respect and now suddenly when I, when I, when I, when I read them again, I, I can see that it just emerged from a certain political belief. Um, so that is the, that is not enough for me. Okay, so I have a very specific question here. Uh, like we talked about uh, the uh, the political and historic books in like for, for politics and history. Is there any book in regard to mathematics that like you would recommend to people? Hey, is there, if there is one book in regard to maths, this is this one book because I think the politics doesn't come there. So let's talk about, I have had to ask this very concise question about mathematics. Uh, I just absolutely loved uh, a book called Infinite Powers by Stephen Strogatz. He's a mathematician and it is a history of calculus. So it, I got everything in it. It had history, yeah. it had calculus and so that by nature it's very philosophical. You know, because I mean, I, I as a writer who was dealing with maths, I mean, I, I used to like maths. I got more mar marks in maths than in English. Uh, so uh, I used to think that this this big thing is interesting because the only thing in math which is approximate, and I th I thought that I was arriving at this analysis in a poor way. That I mean, obviously, how can anything be approximate in maths? But yeah. calculus is the science of approximation. When I read this book, I fully Understood. So what is uh, what is interesting now about this book, and there was another book I wanted to recommend, uh, which is more science, uh, which is called Faraday, Maxwell, and the Electromagnetic Field, which sounds heavy, but it is one of the best histories you will read because it is the history of electromagnetism told through Michael Faraday and James Maxwell, whom the authors kind of, I think the authors have a crush on Maxwell because the way he comes 
you know emerges in the book and uh, it is just uh, fantastic even in inf infinite powers the characters when were like newton we think newton is a genius but newton is way beyond that you know when you're reading about newton you, you know you, you kind of you, you find it hard to believe that this guy existed and uh, the I mean the way uh, I, I took two one and a half months to read this book because i would go back i would not understand some paragraphs i had to then make some of a few other references but in the end i understood calculus nice the book is also meant to help me understand it is it is for the lay people yeah uh, but i was just i want to make a movie on the history of calculus i'm telling you if i had if i had the influence oh. of the spielberg or the studio this would be the movie i will make you know it is just fabulous it has it has heroes and villains you know and uh, so some of the celebrated mathematicians are total assholes you know and they were just uh, aristocrats who sabotaged anything so it's very interesting i have a question here like money like if i may like uh, dig, dig deeper into this uh, yeah. this is just about the depiction of maths on screen also because see i still don't know what calculus is i i know like ki i passed maths like with like 80 85 numbers but i don't know how i did that but like you see movies like of like benedict cumberbatch or like like these films where you get to see okay the person is sitting there and all these formulas are coming and everything is coming so but do you think is has there any like it can be a movie it can be something else also where people are able to depict maths ki uh, and make it interesting i get like there is this one book for it but in, is there anything in regard to the visual universe which you can think hey ki, this made me more excited about maths because we see things hey this is making me more excited about science fiction i see arrival i am like i want to get into this deeper is there anything in regard to mathematics and its depiction on visual medium that where you have felt hey i want to get deeper into this it can be differentiation it can be calculus and you are like ki i can think of this and like this made me excited i think for a generation a beautiful mind did it but then if you're oh, not yes. if you're not read yes. the book because the book was exceptional but even beautiful mind was very hollywood very basic it just covered yeah. the interesting aspects of it and there's something about the sound of game theory every guy wanted to talk yeah. about game theory it is one of those things it's like it just sounds like game and theory it just had the you know so uh, so what happened was john nash the mathematician who's yeah. in the heart of that story he visited bombay yeah. he came to the taj hotel okay and uh, that banquet hall was filled with i'm not exactly like find it 600 people in suit just like the richest people you know would usually go to some cultural event they all came to see john nash Oh. Now, John Nash is a person when he, I, I'm sure you're aware that he he had some severe mental health problems, so he's not someone who's articulate about anything outside yes, maths. Yes. So he said that nobody understood anything, you know, uh, and because they came to meet uh, to uh, to meet Russell Crowe. Ah uh, yeah but actually they were disappointed that John Nash was standing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh uh... So yeah, so beautiful mind is definitely a movie that did it for me and for a lot of people because like the way they also use music in it and like the there is a song called a scope for kaleidoscope or something and I, it it is something that still stay, stays with me. So it's interesting you bring the, that up. How is the book like if uh, like you? The book is more complex. The book is a whole biography of a time and uh, and, uh, and and the person, Miss Sylvia Nasser, you know. Yeah. uh who uh was so so the the book is of uh, course a lot more uh that I, i in fact sometimes i wonder why they didn't use many of the it's, it's there are many cinematic elements in the in, in in the book like for example there is john nash because of his mental condition he used to think that aliens are going to abduct him so his friend asked him was you are the smartest mathematician of your generation how can you believe aliens want to abduct you so john nash tells him that you know the aliens come from the same part of my brain from where my maths come so i believe it you know i have to believe it i mean a, a, a moment of this beauty and it's happened in real life i don't think it's in the movie 
Like, I mean, I mean, if I was writing the book today, I would like, I would start with this. Because <laughs> yeah. This is all our problems. Why do we get into trouble? All of us who do one thing well, why do we behave behave like assholes? Like, why do like people keep they? Why do guys keep thinking with their dick? Because the greatest ideas also come from there. You know, the greatest motivation also comes. So the same things that give us uh, a shot at greatness is also the place from where our greatest delusions come. You know? So, uh, see, actually, uh, more than maths itself, what is interesting is the influence of maths, the combination of maths and humor. There's some kind of a strange connection between maths and the kind of humor I like. Like, I, I'm told that Simpsons is largely, it has a lot of mathematicians uh, who have become the screenwriters, a lot of, many of few, I don't know how many, but I heard that there is a heavy influence of mathematician writers who are writing the Simpsons, who, who used to write the Simpsons. So I feel that there is there a certain bent of mind where, uh, where uh, you know, it is it, it, it also leads to a certain way of looking at the world, which which also results in a particular kind of uh, uh, humor. Yeah. I, I, if I may, I have a recommendation for you. There is this author called Simon Singh and uh, he's written this book called Fermat's Last Theorem where he explains in theory it took approximately 300 years to prove the Fermat's Last Theorem and he talks about the whole story of it and it's again very interesting read. Right. And I think he's written another book describing the mathematics in Simpsons as, a, as well. Which is yeah, very... I'm familiar with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. So that's that's very interesting. Oh, it's interesting how we got to maths now. But I think we can cover all the subjects. We have covered maths, we have covered history, we have covered politics. Do you also read sci-fi? No, I for some reason I, mean, I, I kind of I'm 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 one of those guys who are unmoved by arrival. I read the short story. You know? Okay. So when there was a lot of talk around the movie, I want I want to read the short story first. For some reason, one problem I have is most of what is called science fiction is actually science fantasy. Yeah. There's a bit of science here and there, like there's a bit of science in everything. There's a bit of science in a toothpaste, you know. Vani and I, like, I think developed a uh, much more, uh, in, we developed much more interest in it because we discovered this author called Ted Shang. He wrote this beautiful short story. It's yeah, from I... this book called Exhalation. I think Ted Shang is one person who is doing science fiction and not like... Uh, uh, like the fantasy thing you're saying, because my favorite author yeah. is Ray Bradbury and everyone says he's just writing fantasy, he's not writing science fiction and he's like, okay, cool, I'm writing fantasy. And as a writer, do you think like we need to define genres and like very specific genres? Not at all. I, I think genre is the biggest con. You know, it was just yeah. created by people who were not writers. Maybe it was created by marketing people or people who needed to give a label. It is the most meaningless thing on earth, you know. I think uh, I think we can do without it, but I suppose it has some practical necessity. Like you have to create wooden shelves, and then if you create a shelf, you have to put something somewhere and put something. You need a label, you know. I I have to quickly ask this. It just like it's something I just thought like when you mentioned shelves, which is the best library you have ever visited in your life for like oh, any yeah. it can be any library for me it was my school library <laughs> so which is that favorite library of yours which you have ever visited in your life there is a university of lincoln in a town called lincoln in in the uk i i had to spend two months when i, when I was a journalist i was just attached i, was, I went as a scholar uh, so that was the first time i had access to a quality library Otherwise, I mean, Madras, okay, I uh, we had what is called, uh, you know, I think it was called Kanimara Library, where I used to go. I, 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 I was one of those guys, I sat in Loyola College. I spent, I, I was not a nerd, but I spent a lot of time in the library because I, I was broke and this is, I thought I'd read something free, you know. But they had, uh, they had only books which are really dull you know an academic you know mm. that was my first introduction to the fact that i i honestly i, I know i'm sounding naive and i was 17 i didn't know that most books could be bad i always thought uh -huh. books generally are good then books are only always good you know and uh, once in a while it's your uh, failing that you don't enjoy a book here and there you know but in that library, I, it, it just opened my eyes. I just realized that uh, 
uh, it, it is, it is, it, I don't know why some books are the way they are, you know, so that, so that was interesting. But, uh, but when I was a full adult, uh, I, the first uh, good access I had to a library was in University of Lincoln, and I was already in my early 30s then. And uh, but by then, internet had already. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not someone who's easily romant. You know, have romantic notions for things which are inefficient. You know. Uh, so I didn't see. I don't. I didn't see the point of libraries except as some kind of a curated space, uh, and a good librarian can do magic. But uh, but by the time I had access to a high quality uh, library, it, the internet had already changed many things. You you mentioned that like uh, for libraries that you don't have like you don't romanticize things which are inefficient. Are you a nostalgic person in general? I am. I'm very nostalgic. I like uh, mush also. But uh, uh, when it comes to utility, you know, when I when it comes to things that I need, uh, I need. See, the nostalgia, like I, I even, I'll try to just, I, I, I Google search those were the, those were the days. Even a cliched line like that. I like just looking at that because it's just beautiful. Like those were the, so sad. It's so melancholic. You know what I would like. What is the story behind anybody saying that? You know, those were the days. I still remember when Sunil Gavaskar was about to retire. There was a headline. Uh, in either Hindu or Indian, it was one of those two papers which used to write. Those were the days, and I felt sad for two, three days because uh, of that line. You know? So yeah, so I, I, I am. I, I would say I am nostalgic. So, so if you are nostalgic, I'll reframe my question because I, when I asked you about libraries, it came from the notion of nostalgia. So not libraries, which is that reading place in your life, like a space that you had a corner. It can be from like the time when you were 10 years old or until now, like a corner that you have had in a room from a library, from a bedroom, from a cafe or anything, which you are very, very personal about, nostalgic about. And you are like, hey, if given a chance, I'd always go back to that particular part, place to do my reading. The nostalgia that you're asking about is something which I programmed myself to get out of because I identified a I identified uh, mild megalomania, which is which we all have, and how it comes in the way of a writer's life because writers are so full of themselves. But I know I know, I know exactly what you mean, and those memories are still fresh. My experience of reading *Midnight's Children* when I was I was not uh, very old; I was just probably 16, 17. And those days, I was in Madras, and uh, why I remember this is that I many days I used to wear a lungi and we didn't have AC and all that, you know, those were days when no AC, everybody sweats, everybody, you know, everybody smell, you know, and you're in Madras and uh, there is no secular smell, you know, you, you know, I still remember the smell of Madras, my house, and this is a guy sitting in a lungi and you're reading Salman Rushdie, you know, and for the first time I was introduced to a certain flamboyant prose, and that a prose can be also beautiful. Apart from telling a story that you can play with it. And I you know I kept a notebook to list out words I didn't know. I still remember words like tintinabulation, which I encountered <laughs> from the book. I have a very different opinion of the book right now. When I read. It's shocking. And I think you should never go back to books that you loved when you were 17. You know? That's a different story. Uh, so Midnight Children, to me, was like, a culturally, I was a provincial guy, you know, what you'd call low, like Loyola College, the down market guy, as the name of the name But then these are the books we, we used to read, you know, and uh, I was beginning to learn uh, Cryptic Crossword. And uh, yeah. so uh, I, I, I remember this as the phase when I completely surrendered to English, you know. I was the guy who used to think in, uh, think in Tamil and when I was abusive, probably Malayalam, you know, it's a very underrated language to abuse. Um, but I was beginning to understand the world is much larger in English and they're doing all kinds of stuff which have seemed relevant to me, you know. Uh, so I would say, yeah, I still remember the way I would lie down or sit and hide to read. 
Money, you should also tell us like which is your favorite like library or your reading place in the world because is the is that the one in your background? Yeah, but it's one of my favorite reading spots uh, that I have built myself. But I think my most favorite reading spot used to be when I was growing up and I j- and I had just picked up reading. Uh, my father was transferred in this remote location in Himachal. And uh, I remember one winter when it was snowing outside and uh, I was reading Champak because I was seven and that was the only thing that was available there. But uh, that's still like the fondest memory I have of myself reading. Got it, got it, got it. What about yeah. you? No, I just said like I was in Xavier's Jaipur school and it was the one that like, because there was this, uh, they were, it was in two sections. So there was that one part where no one was there and I have a thing for emptiness. I, I meditate on those things. So that part of the library, which was inaccessible to people, like you see like these movies and places where there is always a part of the library, which is inaccessible to people. And you're like, okay, you want this book. So you'll have to go inside for that. Like something like you saw, saw in Harry Potter, like if you want that particular book on defense against the dark arts, so you will have to go deep inside the library. So yeah, I like that kind of a visual and just, very very passionate about nostalgia and is it something which is harmful because you said you just crack how to get out of it as a writer and i'm like hey let me be here <laughs> it, it just is megalomania i can enjoy it i mean i i, I feel that it it uh, it comes in the way uh, generally speaking you know uh, if we are not aware of it if we are not aware that we are megalomaniacs we uh, are too self absorbed in ourselves uh, our thoughts is okay because you're always cra- trying to crack a thought. Yeah. But in our own lives, the smells, you know, most of the bad copy I've read as an editor, you know, it comes in a form called travel writing. This whole, like the whole entire, all freelancers, they'll say, what do you mean? I do travel writing. Uh, yeah. I enjoy travel. It's like, who doesn't enjoy travel? Should you write about it? You know? The problem I used to face as an editor with most of the copy, I would ask myself, why is it so boring? is that the person has enjoyed something so much. You know, it could be sitting on the street and having a cake. You have no idea how boring it is for other people. (laughs) It is exciting for you because you remember the moment you sat on the street, you had a cake, you had a good time. That does not make it interesting. It's a slice of life. Yeah. So it needs to be, you know, as writers, we always have to be mindful of the trap of our own, uh, you know, our own experiences because our experience alone is not enough. So most of the time, I don't know what humility is, but probably asking yourself, is this interesting to other people? Is probably the closest we can come to uh, to, to a, a useful kind of humility. Uh, a writer trying to reach out. You know? So that I think is an interesting technique. Uh, mm. But there is a form of writing which benefits a lot from megalomania. The more self-absorbed you are, more you get the minute details of the monsoon when you walk and your love and all that. You know. uh, but generally, I find it very boring. You know, people tend to write about their crush and their love and their bad marriages, you know, because they are full of themselves. They have yeah. no idea how, how common these experiences are. Most everybody had a crush next door. Everybody has walked in the rain. Everybody, probably most people, you know, have had, a, you know, very comical marriages, you know. So, uh, so what more, do you, you know, actually more is the wrong word. You know? It's not that you need to say something more. We are yeah. all trapped in the same set of, you know, finite things. But uh, what is the layer? What is an additional layer or a filter or a, an interpretation that you have? So okay. that is what I think... Uh, makes writing uh, worth it. Is there any book uh, or like maybe comics or anything that you've ever read in your life which depicted childhood in a way that you enjoyed? Like the part of childhoods or like childhood in totality or any child protagonist where you're like, hey, I, I really like how they have done this. Though I don't want to admit it for some reason. It's that I think Malgudi days captured a certain aspect of Childhood, which I tried to plagiarize in my early 20s, though even, even when I would try to diss uh, R.K. Narayan, you know, it was a strange relationship I had, you know, because I went through a very bad phase where I thought uh, style is writing, 
and the writers who didn't have style uh, had lacked something. It was it was a mistake on my part, and uh, 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 but I could I could see the power of uh, that that simple childhood as an honest guy who was growing in Madras, who was dealing with English more. Many of the th things didn't make sense to me, you know, their culture, the way, you know, the way they dressed, and uh, and uh, the ease with which they could get a girlfriend, you know. I didn't understand those things fully. I could not believe it. I would still rate Malgiri days very highly when it comes to a depiction of honest depiction of childhood. Do you have any favorite book to movie or like say TV series adaptations? Because I think like a lot of times we come across movies that have done books a major injustice. Yeah. I quite like the great, great expectation. I forget the cast, but uh, you know the great expectations that I'm talking about, which is, I think. Do you also have any uh, movies that you'd like to recommend? There is a Tamil movie uh, called Super Deluxe. It is an exceptional movie, I thought. Yeah. Uh, with, with some flaws here and there. Uh, which are interesting in itself, but uh, I, I thought this was very, very brave and very entertaining and hilarious. Uh, do you have more recommendations in regard to movies and like, or it can be TV shows also. Let's talk yeah. about the okay, Fleabag. Okay. I'm, a, a, I'm a big admirer of Fleabag. Fleabag is uh, one of those uh, series that just cracked everything. I, I look at Fleabag this way. It is a comedy about grief at one level. You know, a comedy about grief is always the highest form of comedy. And it specifically, it's a comedy about fe modern female grief. You know? So which I could just sit and enjoy as an outsider because you know, I, I can identify various characters as an outsider, and sometimes as, as one of the villains. Uh, and uh, uh, it's beautifully written and played. It's just, everything is just going well for me. See, this is what I mean by that the, the comic element the metaphor being becoming philosophical, you know, almost where there's this character who she's just talking about a pencil with a rubber at the end of it. And she is talking about the vulnerability of people. And she says that, see, that's why pencils have rubber at the end, because people make mistakes. You know? So this is what comedy does. And this is when comedy is unmatched, you know, when it uh, without an effort. I don't think those good writers have to say, it's okay, now I'm going to talk about seriousness, but in a funny way. Most genuinely funny writers don't even rate themselves fun as funny. Or don't, at that moment, they don't realize they're being very funny, but they just have a way of writing, which is just organically funny. And feedback is, is a kind of, I, my problem, I don't find many things funny, actually. Many, 99% of the sitcoms, you would, if you see me watching those sitcoms, you would think, I mean, I, first of all, I can't watch them, but five minutes is enough for me to know that <laughs> it's working, you know? Yeah. So, Fleabag, I would put it on par with the others that I like, the UK and US office and uh, Modern Family, uh, which is more mainstream. You know, I love it when something mainstream is of a high quality and it doesn't compromise. Absolutely, it. absolutely. That is superb. Mm -hmm. Feedback is not exactly mainstream, but I would I would put it up there. So it's very very it's it's a very special form of comedy. And what is great about such comedies is that they show they keep pointing to the writers that this is possible, that is possible, you know, this can be done. So uh, you said that you don't find ninety nine percent of the things funny. But like Vani and I were like watching some of your interviews and we think, like, I think you must have been told that you have a good sense of humor in general. So uh, I want to know, are there any stand-up comics that you are a fan of, both in, in India and outside of India? I like Kamra, you know, I find him, uh, I find him funny. Okay. I think Louis C.K. is top class. Ali Wong mm -hmm. is exceptional, you know. The first stand-up comedian I ever liked was Sarah Silverman. Ah, uh, nice. An American nice. comic who kind of she's, amazing. she's something else. Ninety-five percent of stand-up, uh, stand-up comedy. I don't find it that good that I should stick on after five, ten minutes. You know, uh, some of them, of course, some of them are very good. Another thing that like we wanted to ask was who are the some of your favorite interviewers, like whom you think 
they did they are doing it right i still like karan thapar for some reason you know, nice i think when, uh, the thing is many of his subjects are actually quite uh, in the sense that they're not dull it says that they are in professions which are exude dull things and they have to be careful but still he somehow makes it uh, entertaining yeah. which uh, which i admire do you also have any favorite like talk show hosts or any like even outside india or like interviewers outside india trevor noah is fantastic and oprah is also i mean she's pretty good at what she does but i never get the feeling with oprah that she is honest you know that is something with an interviewer should have many bbc interviewers have us for some reason i, mean, so I what, don't know the names that, but you know that they mean every sentence that they say but with oprah i I don't think she means anything that anything that I just don't find it convincing but her conversations are powerful that's a very unpopular opinion and I'd like to admit that even I share that no uh, yeah 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 but, uh, so if i may ask both of you what is she doing right she's speaking she she is in complete control of her language and uh, if you are willing to look at that conversation as some kind of a realistic uh, fiction uh then it is it is quite uh, it's quite interesting it's just that i don't find her uh, convincing and her uh, emotions convincing it's a very cliche question but i have to ask it's like one of those questions have you read the harry potter books and like what's your opinion the first and what was your read the first one yeah. you didn't like it i enjoyed it yeah. oh i enjoyed it Nice, nice, nice. See, I, I, I like fantasy, which is very clearly saying fantasy. My only problem with fantasy arises when it tries to, like, with, uh, with what is universally called magic realism. I've written about it. The whole point of Harry Potter was fantasy, you know, uh, uh, which is juxtaposed with reality. The thing is that if a donkey is going to talk, then there is no point to the love story also that you're going to say because the donkey talking is the greatest story on earth so when you're trying to be realistic uh, yeah and then suddenly a donkey begins to talk there is no meaning to what is going what else is going on see now harry potter got it right because there's magic and then magic is everything right what harry potter tried to say is there's something extraordinary out there and that's correct because if people got to know that there is magic out there the world will collapse you know but in in modern ma- magic realism it is just a logic for me that that you will have a bit of magic and then you know try to tell another story which which becomes unremarkable by the very watchy of magic yeah, i have to ask about murakami now and like uh, which are like uh... <laughs> is you know if fish is going to suddenly it's rain fish i don't know why he does it like first of all i hope i don't meet murakami and i find it also strange that some readers feel that i'm india's murakami i don't know what i don't know what that means because i feel that we're very different kind of writer what i like about murakami is that you just inside the story somehow because of his simplicity yeah some of his had coffee and then they have, the japanese have a way of description which is very similar to tamilian where tamilian will when a tamilian is describing a place he'll give you the full address almost the pin code you know you take the left and right and you know the same thing the japanese guys will do their description of places how actually about the streets and you know but there's something nice about it because it is japan and all the kind of but i don't know why he suddenly makes fish rain because <laughs> he's a very very honest honest man very honest writer everything is going fine you don't need to do anything you t- you've got the story you've got the reader you have a simple prose which is you know taking people in uh and on top of it i mean i i'm very confident he's an honest guy you know? <laughs> not a fake why i don't understand why writers do this why is it raining fish of course sometimes it it does rain fish that's a different issue see people uh, people misunderstand the uh, the origin of south american magic realism the way i see it okay, because when the okay. so called critics don't like because i i like gabriel garcia marquez i think i understand what he was doing and first of all this so called magic realism is there just in one or two one or two books and maybe a few short short stories you know 
that he's clubbed, I mean, that is described as a magic realist is also a great injustice. What Marcus was doing is that he was conveying an ancient language because he was brought up by his grandmom and he spent a lot of time with the with old people, with ancient people. So he created a literary device where he transmitted information the way it was told without the condescension of interpretation, you know? Now, if I tell you what my grandmom told me about her village, you know, like for example, there is a metaphor in Kerala. I mean, let's say one day a man came to our village and he had four hearts. That in Malayalam, in, in a certain kind of a dialect means uh, he was very strong. And they say a guy is very strong, he'll say he had four hearts. Hmm. What Marcus does, you know, he would say, one day this, we were all sitting in the village and the guy came and this guy had four hearts. Similarly, he's also, he also has information from a time when things were not labeled, diseases were not labeled. So there is one disease that he mentions in 100 Years of Solitude, which was discovered 15 years after the book was published in a village, you know, where, where the whole village lost its memory, you know, because of an illness. Yeah. You know, I'm sure now we have names for it. So, I mean, I, I'm saying that I mean, he also added a bit of fantasy here, but chiefly what he was doing, why the novel was powerful, was that he created the ancient world and he, and he did not interpret an ancient language. This is how people used to speak. They used to speak in metaphors and metaphors had magic because either it's born out of ignorance, whatever it was. Now, for example, a few, see, I don't know if people remember this. 10 or 20 years ago, it rained red on, in Kerala. The rains were red. You know? Literally. Literally. So a guy wrote without the condescension of interpretation. He would say that one day we were sitting and it rained red. The trees turned red. The well turned red. It was all blood, you know, everywhere. What had happened was one of the theories is that there was a meteorite which had erupted over Kerala wow. at that time during the monsoon and that created a certain, a certain iron density and that is one of the theories okay that it, but, but it did rain right because it's 20 years ago and it had complete photographic and video evidence now this had happened uh, 300 years ago people who would have converted into a tale and it would have been passed on and it would have been told to a guy like uh, Gabriel Garcia Marcus by his grandmom that you know, then in this year it turned, uh, it, it rained red. Everything was red, you know, and you could put a glass out of it and it was just red. But it's a fact. It just seems like magic, you know. Uh, so, you know, uh, so I so I feel that uh, this creation of this label has. I mean, a lot of writers get irritated when I say this, because they are all writing their novels and I'm sure there's a bit of magic in it. And what happens is that it's such a lonely enterprise when you're writing, even if you're writing about your own parents or your own life, uh, people are tempted to take a break from the tedium with a bit of magic. They want, they'll write the uh, thing, which is like, so some very intelligent friends have argued against me where saying that it is just a device, look at it as a device. You know, everybody knows that the pig is not talking. You know, it is supposed to mean something else. I don't know what, what is the meaning of fish raining. I don't know what it does. It ruins it for me, okay, that, uh, that you work so hard for 300 pages to tell me it's real. See, every story, uh, has a fundamental uh, conceit, which is that I want you to know, I want you to believe in it. Yeah. Then you need to have exceptional reasons to be completely incredible or in, in, incredulous. So, uh, uh, but if it's a story entirely based on fantasy, it's a different issue. Uh, two questions and I just quickly want to go back to Murakami. A very specific question, which are your, which is your favorite Murakami book or a short story that you thoroughly enjoy? No, I, I did enjoy Norwegian book and I enjoyed most of Kafka on the, sh on the show. It's okay, mm. you know, 
my second question about muragami was do you think he's he can get away with anything in regard uh, to magic realism no no he can because he's a super, he's a superstar I mean, murakami okay. can do anything and you know it is uh, i mean whether if you're asking me whether he can pull it off as a writer because no 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 in the in the like the sense of viewership like people will be like it's murakami so it must be something no yeah yeah yeah, yeah. He, so he's got that cult following and also a broad base in this whole thing you know we uh, we used to think i don't know if you shared this that the fan was someone who was knowledgeable right but actually the fan is not that fan is someone who just wants to adore you know who's waiting for a reason you know like uh, like for example most of the science fiction fan it is not like uh, actually christopher nolan is the worst science fiction maker ever this will be our precap then everyone will watch this video <laughs> and christopher nolan is not a fan of science any guy who's a fan of science especially if you're a lay person like me yeah would immediately know that christopher nolan is not a fan of science he might be a fan of science fiction and films i think he's more a fan of films the science in all his films is bullshit okay starting let's like, like like let's start with the I mean, he used to make good films before they started giving him money. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> prestige. Absolutely unnecessary to bring Tesla in. Okay, you can bring in. See again, this is the he. He has the excitement of an amateur. You know, the guy who has read one article about the rivalry between Edison and Tesla will write that. Just uh, make that film. You know, it's like oh, it's so interesting. You know, oh, sure. and why? Absolutely unnecessary to bring that magical. element and which is which is what is not even science right because if that science existed then uh, it would be something else but it was a great film he didn't ruin it with science okay he took a he took a medical condition and he flew with it now but if you take films like uh, in, in interstellar if you have read brief history of time at least the first half like everybody has read I men at least the people who are serious about reading it read the first half of brief history of time book gets i think very heavy it's the same thing okay there are five things about black hole okay six things about gravity it's the same thing you know there's nonsense about time travel you know it's the same hmm. thing there's nothing new that uh, that he dealt with and uh, in uh, in inception again you know some some of the some of the uh, elements that uh, he discusses were so nice that i was very surprised i'm really really wanting to know your opinion about tenet so tenet is rubbish what a nonsense nonsensical <laughs> movie you know i mean this is the kind of i i understand that i i mean i i, I understand successful people going wrong because i mean uh, because you are successful because you in you had an instinct and others questioned it and you are proved right and the reason why these guys make uh, rubbish movies is that they have very low opinion for the other people's opinion so when i'm sure some friend of his would have read the screenplay of tenet and said boss so that's what i'm saying there is no science in tenet okay there is there is you know this so called complexity is the complexity of simple things you know that that things can move back and this these these fans of nolan and the fans of sci-fi they are not really knowledgeable people you know their fandom does not emerge from knowledge yeah it emerges from adoration so so to me I, i and the reluctance that people have to you know in pointing out that tenet was a stupid film is that that fear of the stature of of uh, of a successful filmmaker you know i think we if we really like nolan we will be telling him that just don't uh, don't do it you know it's like absolutely you, you know ours is a recommendation channel there are more than 800 videos and we have this thing in on our constitution of chalchitra let's not talk bad about things even then i made a video on why i did not like tenet yeah. we always try not to talk badly about things we don't like but tenet like just made me go like yeah i have to call him out for his bluff dude like this is but this what is interesting for you is to gather people who liked tenet and make i won't be able to i'll be very angry throughout the thing i don't no, think but that'll be interesting to see what he- 
you yeah. look in such good a shape and like uh, i think you have been like taking very good care of yourself in terms of the physical aspect of things yeah. please uh, tell us uh, some like recommendations in regard to exercising and just taking care of your physical health when it comes to fitness already there is an over articulation in the world and what most people are actually saying when they recommend is why can't you be like me i uh, I I've always rated fitness very highly. Even as a writer, I feel that the fitter you are physically, more drafts you can write. Uh, otherwise, you're constantly in. Your body wants you to stop writing, and most of the self compliments that you get from your mind is because of fatigue. You know, yeah. uh, you stop writing a novel because of fatigue. But anyway, to answer your question, I I run and uh, I. I uh, I am a mediocre athlete, which always uh, I'm I'm an ungifted athlete. You know, so I have to always work hard uh, to achieve things which will come naturally to athletes. So I enjoy that. I enjoy my mediocrity as something because then I plan, I talk about it, I read about it. You know, I I do stuff. So every day uh, I I run in the morning. Most days I run and. Um, in the evenings i work out i do push ups now i'm 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 training for handstand are you able to do handstand no i can i can stand for 2 uh, 3 uh, seconds but i just started a month ago so i need to i think i'll take another one or two months and then i feel that oh. i'll be able to yeah and and in terms of nutrition also are you like have you made some major changes uh yeah i don't eat grain or sugar for 6 days a week and what do you do on the seventh day like do you it's like a, day, i just kind of i think out? nobody nobody enjoys food the way i do on a sunday nice <laughs> i deliberately right on uh, i eat only unhealthy stuff and uh, you know uh, so uh, i include the masala chai as as a dessert by the way the way indians have it with sugar so i am a very boring person that way so it, i could see that it irritates people you know in the shows Uh, from fortunately my social life is a bit limited otherwise people get irritated by people who don't uh seem to eat like them you meet uh, you meet 10 junkies and you don't smoke they wonder what you're doing similarly when people are having maida and sugar and you're not having it they don't like you yeah man so it's a contract which i understand actually it's fair i, I think i understand that point it is irritating i mean i would be very irritated to meet someone like me there is uh, like completely unrelated com- uh, one of the last questions from mine i'm currently reading this book by tim ferris called tribe of mentors where he just puts out the excerpts of his podcast and there is this one question he asks everyone and i have just like taken it from there which is that one product that you have bought for less than 100 which you think has been a very worthwhile investment in your life you know what i i bought this amazing uh, suitcase you know so i always used to be the hostel like whatever suitcase is there you know i'll just take it and then i would always realize that a suitcase is a totally underrated thing yeah. you know it you know i uh, i i think that you should have it should everything should be been well well designed So recently, I bought a suitcase which could also be unique because otherwise my suitcases were so unremarkable that you know I would always fear that someone else will walk away with it. Um, so yes, to answer your question, I'm uh, under if it's under seven thousand rupees, it's a, some kind of a greenish suitcase. Uh, before I ask my last question, Manu, is there anything that you think we missed out and something that uh, you'd like? Us to add on. Actually, when you mentioned Tim Ferriss, I just remember you yeah. asked me about uh, interviewers. Well, like, yes. I think Tim Ferriss is very good. You know, I I like Tim Ferriss among the podcast and a guy called Peter Attia, who's a doctor. Okay. And uh, in matters of health, I always try like to cross check with. I always check with Peter Attia. He's done a podcast on that. I find him. Uh, it's a very good interviewer, and and he is also I would say a health expert. uh but i find tim ferris and peter atia and the whole podcast culture interesting because as i said there is an over articulation of health 
where everybody is trying to crack it and uh, and i feel that americans talk a lot about everything you know so that is the way i suppose mm-hmm. they are and uh, we have also well, we have also started getting trapped in that orbit of talking a lot about this you know uh so which i find it very interesting which makes me makes me ask should we talk or should we not talk you know i don't i just know that we are talking a lot you know but what i don't know is whether uh whether we should talk a lot because we don't know or because we don't know should we just shut up uh i find this interesting because i feel that uh, we are as humans we are very professional in some things and we are amateur uh, very amateurish in some things and the more amateurish we are the more we talk you know uh uh so i i feel i so i don't know which side is me is creating this over articulation uh how to be how to do stuff you know and this is good that is bad latest research this that you know uh i feel that it is part of our self absorb absorption you know uh earlier as we discussed we our mild megalomania yeah uh, had only nostalgia now we have measurements we have blood reports see actually the most people have nothing much to talk about themselves so now they have the blood reports they have their oxygen uh, you know uh, and they have uh, their heart rate you know and they you know and they have a podcast which is now become like astrology you know because when they talk about types of people they think one type is them you know so we are moving into the age of over articulation which will have its own consequences there you have the final questions like pack, wrapped in together the habits and uh, like a book recommendation in regard to self improvement a book that i enjoy i mean, I, i usually stay away from such books of uh, uh, as I, mean, i i i think nobody wants to use self improvement anymore but that's only because that term has become somewhat deep yeah. but i think yeah. everybody likes to read uh, on that subject but i think it's called zero to one by peter thiel yes so that book i found that book very interesting almost uh, philosophical and uh, very uh, rude and interesting and boring and blunt uh, nice. and very very useful uh, not only uh, not only if you are interested in business or to start in starting your own business but just how uh, how to look at the world and this is one area where our billionaires are stupid you know where the american billionaires have found the voice because that is that is a that is a mind to be a billionaire is a mental uh state of being you know uh, because a certain magical world opens only to you you know and it is interesting to you know you should talk about it you know and i don't know why uh our rich guys are very busy trying to i know hide it i don't know what you know so we don't hear the voice of the super rich which is interesting in its own way that like for example peter thiel's perspective uh i mean i mean it is too simple even to call it perspective like he talks about how why the why is the restaurant business tough so the number of tables is set the number of patrons is set so your revenues are finite everything is set so why would you want to do that you know unless you have other reasons i suppose to say you you write a book okay in theory at least it's in finite it can any number of copies can sell a recommendation in general that you think maybe perhaps has helped you in your daily routine or perhaps you've seen people change after they've inculcated that habit i feel food is what is going to kill us you know as in we need it to live and i feel that we should uh, look at ourselves uh in a way which is not self absorbed and congratulatory you know in the sense of what i mean is just because your mom made something mm-hmm. it does not mean it won't kill you that culture is a sugar delivery device you know that culture mm-hmm. things triumph because they are tasty and things are tasty for a reason you know i don't think we should deny ourselves anything but i feel that we should be it's a lot of fun to be alive you know i know it sounds 
<laughs> it's almost sounds stupid but the fun of being alive comes in cons- comes with constantly being aware of everything and experimenting with yourself and be very suspicious as if we are we are in an over articulated world where people are always saying things but you have a body like recently a few days ago or not few days a few years ago i got into an argument with a screenwriter someone introduced the screenwriter to me saying that oh you guys will get along you should talk to me within one minute we had a fight <laughs> because i was saying something about psychology and he was asking uh, what have you read have you read this course you have your own brain you know you don't need to read 10 books on, on your brain you know you know uh, you know what you have you know so i feel that we should also keep exper- uh, not experimenting but listening to ourselves you know and and uh, when it comes to food i feel that most of the advice is bad advice you know because it suits some people or uh, people have a way of looking at life i like the realization in me after i started this slightly longer fast that after i eat my body is actually in shock so i find that very interesting uh, so i so uh, the process of discovery uh, is is what i think uh, i would recommend this is this is very very good and on the note that food is what will kill us uh, i think we can end the <laughs> conversation <laughs> and uh, thank you so much manu for doing this i i I I had so many more questions, but one particularly about Nicholas Talley and your opinion about him. No, but... actually, I'm uh, sorry, I didn't mention Nicholas. Well, I I like uh, uh, Nassim Nicholas Talley a lot. Uh, his latest book, More Than Black Swan, is what I would recommend. Skin in the game. Sorry. Skin in the game. Skin in the game. You know, so Skin in the Game is a collection of essays. Uh, very enjoyable stuff and. Uh, He's a very enjoyable man, but you What have, you have to be. What is the way he is on Twitter? It's like so polar opposite. He looks so fragile on Twitter, and he has written a book called Anti Fragile. The way he fights with Snowden on Twitter. What's your opinion about? He's always he's always fought with uh, he's always fought with people whose opinion he does not value. Mm. Uh, so which makes him uh, very interesting. That's why even when you are admiring him as a writer, you need to hold your own. Uh, opinions you know like for example he's against everybody who supports jmo according to talib is corrupt in some way and then when you search for his own arguments on why he feels that jmo is not uh, is is not good for health they are not that uh, rigorous so i i i i find him very interesting and that is that is not something which you can say about a lot of people these days nice 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 but uh, uh, yeah i am glad like you answered this question as well and thank you so much manu for doing this with us and uh, uh, before we go if if there if if you can just ask uh, the fans uh, that uh, will watch this particular episode and the viewers to subscribe to our channel chalchitra talks that would be really amazing i'll do that yeah okay. so uh, so you want me to do that now Yeah, yeah. Uh, you are, uh, okay, you want me to say subscribe to? Yeah, yeah. Just, just subscribe Chala to Chala 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 talks. Yeah. Yes. Okay, guys. Uh, subscribe to Chala Chitra. <laughs> I've never done something like this. So yeah. So subscribe to Chala Chala Chitra talks. Correct. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh. Uh. Can we release the unedited version of this? <laughs> That would be funny, actually. Yeah. Guys, I I strongly recommend that you subscribe to Chala Chitra Talks. I will. Hey. <laughs> Bye. This was a, this is absolutely this was amazing. amazing. Thank you so much, Manu. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.